Hello and welcome to another episode of WhatsApp Prof. Good day, Walter. Hi, Martin. Are you doing good? Yes, I'm doing fine, thank you. Yeah, it's wonderful to be back. So, let's first open with a word of prayer and then we can discuss what we're going to be doing. Our Heavenly Father, thank you that we can be here again and discuss important matters. Thank you for the opportunity. We ask that you please enlighten our minds, send the Holy Spirit to, to help us and also protect us with your holy angels. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Martin, there's so much talk about the latter rain uh, that is to be expected, the times we are living in, and uh, perhaps we should look at some of the movings of the Spirit mm -hmm. and what, what we can expect and why and how can yeah. we expect the outpouring of the latter rain. And is well, it something we can just ask for? Can you maybe just briefly explain what does latter rain mean? Well, the latter rain is the, the final outpouring of the Spirit comparable to what happened in Pentecost, or so during Pentecost, just on a wider scale. Okay. And, uh, you know, people are praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But is it that simple? We have to look at some of some of the issues yeah. involved. And also, exactly what does it mean? Is it this, this uh, outpouring that everybody will receive it and... There will be a sudden change of heart. Mm -hmm. Will that happen? Or must the preparation take place before uh. the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? So these are all kinds of questions, you know. Many, many believe that uh, if we fervently pray for the outpouring of the Spirit, then it will happen. Hmm. But uh, are there conditions attached? So will it necessarily happen without fulfilling the conditions? That's what we have to look at. We have to, because if there are, it's necessary that we know what it is. Yes. And what does the Spirit do? It transforms the heart, right? Mm-hmm. So without uh, the manifestation of a transformed heart, business as usual is not going to cut it. No. So our backdrop over here has the symbol of the dove, the moving of the spirit. It has the people subject to the rain, as mm -hmm. we see over here. So there are a lot of things to discuss, so let's jump into it. Malachi chapter 4, verse 4. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb, for all Israel with the statutes and the judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse, so, Martin, here is the promise of the Elijah message. Mm -hmm. Not the literal prophet, but the, the message of the prophet that yeah. will come before the dreadful day of the Lord. But it's interest, interesting that it's prefaced with this, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant. Oh, yeah. You cannot separate the law from the issues involved in the end times. From the message. Yes. You cannot. You cannot separate the law from the issues involved in the beginning. True. From Adam and Eve all the way through. And we looked at it in the last one that we did about how the plan of salvation is to unfold. So the big problem is that people want to separate the law of Moses from the issues. Mm -hmm. And from the message. And from the message. Now, what did Elijah do? El Elijah's message is basically that he's not the troubler of Israel, yeah. but ye, pointing to the king, mm -hmm. which is a type of the kings of the world, mm. for you have forsaken the commandments of God, yeah. and you followed Baal. So that is, that is the message, a return to primitive godliness and obedience to God's statutes. That is the Elijah message. Yeah. 
And also an important part in this Elijah message is to turn the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest he come and smite them. Correct. So there's a, there's a reconciliation message in that as well. Yes, but there must be a turning of heart. It, 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 it can't be a superficial union. Exactly. It's got to be a heart turning. Yeah. And remember, Elijah confronted the prophets of Baal. Mm -hmm. Now it's very interesting that fire came down from heaven. Mm -hmm. and consumed the sacrifice of Elijah. But even though the prophets of Baal had danced and cut themselves for an entire day, nothing happened. The end of the message is that the prophets of Baal were destroyed. Yeah. Now, we don't have to take that through literally. We can take it through typologically. Mm -hmm. The message has to destroy Baal worship in us. Yes. It must yeah. destroy Baal worship. In us, like you mentioned. Yes, and yeah. Baal worship is a counterfeit. Mm. It's a counterfeit worship. And the Elijah message was very straight. You have forsaken the commandments of God. And Baal forsakes the commandments of God mm. and puts human laws in the place thereof. Yeah. So return back to the fathers and turn the hearts of the children. James 5 tells us, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he receive the early and the latter rain. Now, is he talking about literal fruit here, Martin? No. No, he's talking about spiritual yeah. fruit. That which Israel was destitute of. The fig tree had no fruit. It yeah. had presumptuous leaves, but it had no fruit, right? And he's talking about the early and the latter rain. And who's the husbandman? Jesus. What's he waiting for? Well, for fruit. The, yeah. He's waiting for fruit. So Martin, without the fruit, can you expect the early and the latter rain? No. No, he's it's a, waiting for the fruit. Yeah. It's the same that you shall know them by their fruits. If they just talk the talk, but don't have any fruits. So if they don't want the fruits, then the house is left to them desolate. desolate. So it's a very serious message and a very serious situation. And Martin, I believe we're very close to these final events. Yeah. So if we are close to it, then it's very important that we start getting the fruits. Okay. Do you think the husbandman was patient until now? Oh, yes, definitely. Has More he been patient. patient with his church, his Laodicean church? <laughs> I think so. Has definitely. he given them enough rope? Sure. Eh? <laughs> yes. Okay. Now, this spirit that we are expecting, well, the spirit has always been working, otherwise there'd be no conversions and mm. nobody would accept Christ, right? But this spirit is called the spirit of truth. And the world cannot receive it. Mm. So if you have anything worldly in you, you cannot receive it. Such an important statement that. Because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. So this spirit of truth, and there are the three definitions of truth. The word is truth, mm -hmm. Jesus is the truth, the law is truth. You take any one of those three out, then you have a partial truth. Mm. And a partial through truth just doesn't cut it, no. right? And he dwells with you, but that's not enough. He has to be in you. Mm. Now, can the spirit of truth abide with the spirit of error? No. It's very important, right? It's like, what does Christ have to do with Belial? Yeah, they are Cannot. mutually exclusive. Well, John fifteen twenty six, And when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. So the whole Godhead is involved mm. in this mission. 
And it has to testify of Christ. Yeah. Now, Martin, what if you elevate the spirit and make him the standard and the norm and thereby reduce the role of Jesus? Is there something wrong then? Yeah, because then it's turned on his head. Okay. So it has to testify of Christ. Mm -hmm. So if the spirit doesn't elevate Christ, then there's something wrong mm. with that spirit. You have mm. to be very careful, right? Mm. Or John 16, verse 13, Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. In other words, the word will become very precious. Jesus will become very precious. Yeah. And the law will become very precious. Yes, yes. All three of them. All three. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So the Spirit not only testifies of Christ, it doesn't only testify of the truth, but it is also prophetic. Mm. Tells you what is going to come. Yeah. Now, if uh, John Paul II said that the Holy Spirit is the one that we want to adore. Yeah, no, that's false. Then there's something wrong because mm -hmm. it's missing out that he shall testify of Jesus, right? That's the main focus of the Spirit. So don't shift the focus from Jesus to the Spirit. No. And don't underestimate the Spirit because without the Spirit, which was sent from the Father and from the Son, you will not be able to stand in the last days, right? True. 1 John 4 verse 6, We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us, and he that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. All right, what did John testify of? What was his whole aim in life? What was he testifying Well, he to? was testifying that Jesus is God. That he is the Son of God yeah. and that he is the Creator. Yeah. So uh, if the Spirit doesn't want to hear this, then it is the Spirit of error. Mm. It's as simple as that. So can you, you cannot disconnect any of them, right? No. Okay. John 14, verse 26 I think everybody should read chapter 14 every single day. Yeah. Just to get, to, to remind yourself. Yes. Mm. But the comforter, it's such a, it's, it's such a comforting word. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Okay, so that's a promise. Number one, he'll teach you all things. So this all things that Jesus, all the truth, all truth will yes. be. So how much can you leave out? Nothing. Nothing. You have to accept it all, right? Can you cut off the Old Testament? I, uh, no, especially not. I don't not. need it. No. No. And bring all things to your remembrance. So with our feeble minds, fallen brains, we need the Holy Spirit to remind us of certain things, yeah. to open certain drawers in the brain, right? Yeah, yeah. And whatsoever I have said unto you. Well, you just said, did Jesus speak in the Old Testament? Well, didn't the prophets say when there wasn't even a New Testament uh, that prophecy didn't come from man but came from God as the Spirit spoke okay. through them, as the Holy Spirit spoke? John 16, verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. If I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now, why would he make a statement like that? Why could the Comforter not be there when Jesus was still here on this earth? Why did he only come afterwards? Isn't that an important question? It's a very important question. And it was a promise. Mm. And it was poured out in a great measure at Pentecost. Now, when Jesus was on earth, he was in confrontation with the forces of evil. Mm. Right? Yes. And he overcame them in the Garden of Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. 
And he triumphed over them at the cross. Yeah. And then he had to go to his father. Do not detain me, he said to Mary, because I have not yet gone to the father. Mm. But I will go to the father and then I'll come back. And he made this promise that the comforter would only come after he had departed, mm. when he was assured that his sacrifice was sufficient and accepted, then he had the right to send the Spirit in measure. Wow. Right? That's amazing. That's true. Yeah. So it was the confirmation yes. of the coronation of Christ. So that his work that is done and he said was finished was acceptable to the Father. Yes. And then when he is come, what will be his job? He will reprove the world of sin mm. and of righteousness and of judgment. Now, when you think of the Pentecostal movement, reproving the world of sin, sin is the transgression of the law. But the majority of the Pentecostal movement says the law has been done away with. Yeah. So they've removed one third of the definition of truth. <laughs> Right? Yeah. And of righteousness. Where do you get your righteousness from? From Christ. From Christ. And of judgment. Judgment means there must be a standard of judgment. That's what it. is the standard of judgment? The law. The law. So he'll reprove the world of the transgression of the law. And that is the standard of judgment. And you better accept the righteousness of Christ or else you're not going to have a leg to stand on. Correct. Then that law is going to condemn you. All right. Of sin, hmm. because they believe not on me. Sure. Why did Christ have to die? We discussed yes. it in the last one. And sin is the transgression of the law, but rejecting Christ is rejecting the law. Exactly. It's yes. under, it cannot be severed. Because it's his character. Mm. You can't do that. Of righteousness, because I go to my father and you see me no more. So there you have the promise of the acceptance of the sacrifice. Yeah. Of righteousness, is it acceptable, mm. my sacrifice, to justify humanity through my righteousness? Well, you will see it when I go to my father and you see me no more. Then the spirit will be poured out. Does that begin to make sense? Yeah, now? definitely. Okay. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Uh -huh. So when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit takes place, it means that Christ has taken back the keys. He is again the one who has redeemed humanity and this world and the prince of this world who is Satan is judged. Yeah. So the outpouring of the Spirit is the confirmation of the victory and the coronation of Christ. Amazing. It's interesting, eh? Wow. And one doesn't often read these verses like this. You just glance over them. You don't. Don't look at why is the wording so strange. And it gives you a whole picture of how the plan of salvation did not just end at the cross. No. It went forth into heaven. Yes, where he is now mediating on our behalf. Mm. We have an advocate in heaven. The comforter is called the spirit of truth. This comes from the desire of ages. Everybody should read that book. Oh, definitely. His work is to define and maintain the truth. He first dwells in the heart as the spirit of truth and thus becomes the comforter. So when you live in the world that we are living in now, I think it's quite necessary that we have a comforter, don't you think? That's, uh, you, you go crazy in this You world. will. But the, another thing that I see here is if you have the spirit of truth, then he becomes the comforter. So if you don't have the spirit of truth, yes. if you think you have the spirit, but you don't keep the, to what the definition of truth is, which is the law and all of that, you cannot be comforted. You cannot be comforted. There's comfort and peace in the truth, but no real peace or comfort can be found in falsehood. It is through false theories and traditions 
that Satan gains his power over the mind. By directing men to false standards, he misshapes the character. Through the scriptures, the Holy Spirit speaks to the mind and impresses truth upon the heart. And this is very, very important. It is through the word, which is the definition of truth, that God speaks to you. Uh, it doesn't say through your feelings. Oh, that's so important. You come out of the charismatic mm. movement. It is an emotional event. Exactly. You're waiting. You, you believe you don't, haven't received the Spirit until there's an emotion. Yes. Thus he exposes error and expels it from the soul. It is by the Spirit of truth working through the Word of God that Christ subdues his chosen people to himself. So you negate the Word and elevate the experience and you are on very dangerous ground. Mm. In describing to his disciples the office work of the Holy Spirit, Jesus sought to inspire them with the joy and hope that inspired his own heart. He rejoiced because of the abundant help he had provided for his church. The Holy Spirit was the highest of all gifts that he could solicit from his Father for the exaltation of his people. The Spirit was to be given as a regenerating agent, and without this, the sacrifice of Christ would have been of no avail. So the Spirit regenerates inside of you. It has yourself. to work in the heart. Yes. There must be a decided change. It's not a manifestation of you having received power, mm. and the power is, is evidence that you are accepted mm. by God. No, no. It actually should humble you uh, and not that's elevate sure. you. That's for sure. It must show you because then you realize how low you are actually yes. because of sin. So the power of evil had been strengthening for centuries and the submission of men to the satanic captivity was amazing. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead who would come with no modified energy but in the fullness of divine power. I think some people might be upset by that statement, but that is how it is. That's how it's written. And even if you compare this to what we've just read in John, there's, there's no argument. There's no argument. I don't it's one and the same. Even go there. It is the spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's redeemer. It is by the spirit that the heart is made pure. So, Martin, what is the work of the spirit? To transform you. Yeah. Not to manifest to other that you suddenly have become a super being. No. And to get you away from worldliness. Yes. Through the Spirit, the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature. Christ has given his Spirit as a divine power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil and to impress his own character upon his church. So the work of the Holy Spirit is transformation of character. That's the work. And if it doesn't do this, then it is a spurious spirit. I might just give a small advertisement. I think people can go and watch your series, Total Transformation, also, again. Okay. So the first disciples went forth preaching the word. They revealed Christ in their lives. And the Lord worked with them, confirming the word with signs following. According to Mark 16, 20, these disciples prepared themselves for their work. Before the day of Pentecost, they met together and put away all differences they were of one accord. Whoa. <laughs> all differences. All differences. <laughs> okay, what was the condition for the outpouring of the Spirit? That was the condition. They must be of one mind. <sighs> they must be of one accord. Martin, can you pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit without fulfilling this condition? No. Is it being done in the world? Yes, there are everywhere people are praying, but not adhering to what is necessary. Okay, so they have 
they have their ideas mm. and the others have other ideas and they get all kinds of labels but they haven't put aside all differences no they believed Christ's promise that the blessing would be given and they prayed in faith. They did not ask for a blessing for themselves merely. They were weighted with the burden for the salvation of souls. It's a very important thing. You know, is, is this outpouring a manifestation selfishly that you want to show that you are accepted or is it that you want to reach souls? See, so sometimes we'll say that we wish Jesus would come. But that's actually a selfish statement. Yeah, I if, want him to come. I want him to but come. But I want to save, I want to see people saved as that's, well. That's uh, our burden as to be souls. The gospel was to be carried to the uttermost parts of the earth and they claimed the endowment of power that Christ had promised. Then it was that the Holy Spirit was poured out and thousands were converted mm. in a day. So Martin, it's very important to be of one accord. So just a question. Is Jesus waiting to come for the church first to become one-minded? Martin, do you think the church will ever become one-minded? No. I don't think so either. But are there people within the church that through studying and prayer are becoming one-minded? Yes. Ah. So is he working on souls? For sure. And will there then be a shaking? Yes. We will still come to that. <laughs> okay. So who is actually in control? Is it God or is it humanity? Is God waiting for his church or is the church waiting for... For God to well, manifest his people. That's, that, the, that's the difference in approach. It's a very good analogy that you just gave. I, I, I love that. God is still in control, so he he's not waiting control. for the church. No, it is presumption to think yeah. that God is subjected to us. Yeah. No. The time will come when he says, ready or not. The end time events are taking place. And then, by what you've just explained... His church, the ones that are waiting, will be ready. They will be ready, and they will be of one accord. Yeah. So praying for the outpouring of the Spirit is an important thing, but meeting the conditions <laughs> is a little bit difficult. Is absolute paramount. So the answer may come with sudden velocity and overpowering might, or it might be delayed for days and weeks, maybe years. Maybe decades, maybe a century, but God knows how and when to answer our prayer. It is our part of the work to put ourselves in connection with the divine channel. God is responsible for his part of the work. He is faithful who has promised. The great and important matter with us is to be of one heart and mind, putting aside all envy, malice, and as humble supplicants to watch and wait. Jesus, our representative and head, is ready to do for us what he did for the praying, watching ones in the day of Pentecost. So in whose hand lies the power? In God, in Jesus' hands. Okay, so he is not impotent, waiting for the church to finally let him in. Actually, his mercy is... Uh, letting the church still struggle to get to this point. Yes. So Portion. what is our job, Martin? To be of one heart and mind, mm. and putting aside all envy, malice, and to watch and to wait. Mm. It's a tough call because that goes against your nature. And Satan is also in the mix here. So he's really trying to keep us not to have this accord. Okay. All right, let's have a look at the example of the reformers. Uh, this is the heading that we find, Withdrawal of the Faithful. After a long and severe conflict, the faithful few decided to dissolve all union with the apostate church if she still refused to re free herself from falsehood and idolatry. So that's what they did, the reformers. Yes. Luther, no matter who they were, Calvin, Knox, whatever their names were, Ridley, Cranmer, all, All of them. them. They had to separate from the churches. 
Why? Because the church refused to free herself from falsehood and idolatry. Has the Roman Catholic Church changed one iota of its doctrines since that time? No, not no. one. So would the same criterion apply? 100%, yes. So what does that do to ecumenism? Sorry, goodbye. Not there's, at all. There's no way. There's no way, because truth and error cannot be bedfellows. No. All right. So what did they do? They saw that separation was an absolute necessity if they would obey the word of God. And it hasn't changed. Nothing has changed. So <laughs> it's still an absolute necessity. They dared not tolerate errors fatal to their own souls and set an example which would imperil the faith of their children and children's children. So when the hearts of the children are turned to the fathers, that means you must accept that error is still error and you cannot be associated with it. That's it. And maybe just to make it clear, this is to separate from those systems, those false systems, yes. not the false errors of people inside the system. Correct. You need to help those people to see the truth. Mm. All right. To secure peace and unity, they were ready to make any concession consistent with fidelity to God. But they felt that even peace would be too dearly purchased at the sacrifice of principle. If unity could be secured only by the compromise of truth and righteousness, then let there be difference and even war. Hmm. That's pretty clear. And that makes sense. And was there difference? Oh, yes. And was there war? Huge. <laughs> okay. Well would it be for the church and the world if the principles that actuated those steadfast souls were revived in the hearts of God's professed people. Well, Martin, that puts a very straight challenge to the church of today. The God's professed people? Yes. Okay. And it is diametrically opposed to some people of high standing mm. who would rather seek compromise and bury doctrinal differences for the sake of peace. Exactly. We must get <coughs> away from being acceptable in the world's eyes and get and stand for what the truth is. Now, Martin, when it came to 1844 and the proclamation of the first angel's message, the time of his judgment has come. Mm. Worship him who made and preaching the everlasting gospel, which in the, go back to the roots, go back to the Bible and what does the Bible teach and not traditions. Mm -hmm. When it came to the second angel's message, Babylon has fallen, has fallen. Were the people compelled to also separate from yeah. the churches that refused to accept the standard? Exactly the same happened again as happened in the reform, reformers' time. And the third angel's message, do not accept the mark of the beast, do not accept a false system of standards no. in the place of the real. Hmm? And that's been running since then. Yes. The, the, the first angel and second angel hasn't stopped. They're still preaching. It's still going. And the third angel is or is, has to be preached. Correct. So modern many who profess to be looking for the speeding coming of Christ are becoming conformed to this world and seek more earnestly the applause of those around them than the approbation of God. They want to be on a list yeah. so that they are accepted by the world. So this list that says Christian, yes. even though the Mormons and all denominations that don't even qualify as Christian is actually on it. Now we have to compromise to be on the list. Yes. I don't think it's uh, what we should do. They are cold and formal like the nominal churches from which they but a short time since separated. The words addressed to the Laodicean church describe their present condition perfectly. They are neither cold nor hot but lukewarm. And unless they heed the counsel of the faithful and true witness and zealously repent and obtain gold refined in the fire, that's character, mm -hmm. white raiment, that's the righteousness of Christ, and I solve, so that you can understand the scriptures, he will spew them out of his mouth. It's pretty straight. Yeah. And it's biblical. And that's the condition. Mm. So we cannot expect 
the latter rain and the outpouring until the conditions have been met. This comes from the story of redemption. The Apostle Paul declares that all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer mm. persecution. They will be called terrorists. It's actually a promise. Yes. Why is it then that persecution seems in a great degree to slumber? The only reason is that the church has conformed to the world's standard and therefore awakens no opposition. <laughs> hey, what do you think about that? I think it's very clear, straightforward. So the religion current in our day is not of the pure and holy character which marked the Christian faith in the days of Christ and his apostles. It is only because of the spirit of compromise with sin, because the great truths of the word of God are so indifferently regarded because there is so little vital godliness in the church that Christianity is apparently so popular with the world. Mm. Let there be a revival of the faith and power of the early church and the spirit of persecution will be revived and the fires of persecution will be rekindled. Martin, do you think the church is ready for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? No. There must come a shaking, right? There must come a shaking. And I think a lot of introspection in all of our hearts. All of us. Every single one of us. Mm -hmm. Nobody is immune from no. this. So what does it mean, unity and the spirit of prophecy? Now, we are throwing a spanner in the works here again, <laughs> which is part of our job. <laughs> <laughs> Can't have it otherwise. Can't have it, no. Some who are not willing to receive the light but who prefer to walk in ways of their own choosing, will search the testimonies to find something in them to encourage the spirit of unbelief and disobedience. Thus a spirit of disunion will be brought in. We're supposed to have union, right? Yes. So what will bring disunion? When you start neglecting the testimonies. And yes, and, and giving them a new format. Yeah, maybe yeah. saying, well, maybe she didn't have the same authority. Mm, or maybe it's just for that time. Or maybe for that time, yes. Thus a spirit of disunion will be brought in, for the spirit which leads them to criticize the testimonies will also lead them to watch their brethren to find in them something to condemn. Satan is constantly pressing in the spurious to lead away from the truth. The very last deception of Satan will be to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. That doesn't mean you're going to take it away. It's you're just going to make it of none effect. Non effect. It's not important anymore. Oh, no, it was for her day. For her day. It was for her time. Didn't have the same authority. Mm. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Satan will work ingeniously in different ways and through different agencies to unsettle the confidence of God's remnant people in the true testimony. Martin, is the spirit of prophecy part of the union that is to be attained? Absolutely. You, agree, you believe that? Absolutely. Her? You believe her? I've had a, I did a sermon once on it where I said, if you want unity in the church... Let's get unity around the spirit of prophecy. Did it go well? Oh. <laughs> no, <laughs> it didn't go well. Eh? No. All right. There will be a hatred kindled against the testimonies, which is satanic. The workings of Satan will be to unsettle the faith of the churches in them. For this reason, Satan cannot have a clear a track to bring in his deceptions and bind up souls in his delusions if the warnings and reproofs and counsels of the Spirit of God are heeded. All right, let me ask the question. Are there people in the church that are studying the spirit of prophecy and want to conform their lives to the standards that are there propagated? Yes, for sure. Are there people that are dead against it? Yes. Do you see it at every potluck? Yes. <laughs> Is there a war? <laughs> a war. Every time, right? Every single time. Now, who's the war against? Is it, is it against you personally you or see, is it against the principle? You see, that's the problem. People should realize it's not against the person. It's against the message. It's against the message. And just think of it. If you, there's unity in some of the things 
of the spirit of prophecy. Yes. But not in all. all. Of it. Not all. But Now, that you uh, have to have it in all. It's just like the Bible. Uh, the Bible. Can you say, I accept this, but I don't accept that? No. Mm -hmm. Well, if the Pope says, we have to throw out doctrine, otherwise we will never get unity. Let's rather concentrate on that which we agree on and forget that which we disagree on. Or as one of them who is no longer alive said, God will sort out all our differences when we get upstairs. I'm sorry, the differences have to be sorted out now. Now. Unity like we've just read. So Martin, would you agree that the Holy Spirit is there to transform our characters? Absolutely. So when Psalms 51 Verse 7 says, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Does this sound like the work of the Holy Spirit? Yes. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. That's a plead. All right. They didn't have the power of Pentecost, but the Spirit was leading Oh, them. for sure, yeah. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy way and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Transgression of what, Martin? The law. Can't get away from it. You can't it. get away and... So can you be converted unto God without this? No. 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 Because as soon as you understand the issue, with horror you will see, but my children are not living up to this standard. Yeah. Or my wife or my husband is not living up to this standard. Or the members of my church or my friends are yeah. not living up to this standard. I better tell them. And then you are very favored. Yes, then you will be very popular. <laughs> All right, Martin, so what should our attitude be towards unbelievers? Now it gets complicated mm. because there's a method of Christ and there's a method of man. Mm. Matthew 9.36, But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them because they had fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. So what must our attitude be to those who do not understand or do not live up to the truth? You have to have compassion and, <laughs> and not get excited. Okay, so you can have a condemning spirit or you no. could have a compassionate spirit. So let's ask God to give us a compassionate spirit so that the Holy Spirit can actually start working. I, I can just maybe add on. If you pray and ask God to give you a compassionate spirit, He's not going to take away the the things that makes you a little bit edgy. No, you're actually probably going to get some more of it. You're probably going to get more edgy. Yeah. That's how you get taught. Mark two seventeen. You know, we always ask the question, "Why me, Lord?" <laughs> It's the wrong question. Yeah. Why not me, Why Lord? Not? <laughs> When Jesus heard it, He said unto them. They that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Mm. All right, so do we become like the Pharisees and condemn everybody that is off the mark? Or are we moved with compassion and call them that are off the mark to repentance? That's our duty. That's, how we sh that's exactly how it should be done. But it's also important to realize he came to call the righteous, uh, not the righteous, but sinners. And it doesn't stop there. No. To repentance. If you leave that repentance out, then, then you have a half a gospel. Hmm. Matthew 9.13, But go ye and learn what that means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. So I don't want a ritual. No. I don't have a, a works-based religion. I want to see mercy. Because yeah. the, the sacrifice is there only as a symbol for the mercy. Yeah. So it's, again, a heart thing. For I'm not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. 
it's it's fascinating that some of the new translation leave that out. Mm. Why do they want a half a gospel? Yeah, uh, the people, and it makes it easy because repentance is not an easy thing. But just being called, that's okay. That's fine. I'm fine like I am. All right. Now, the work of Christ was defined in the Bible. Mm. If that was the work of Christ and we are to be Christ-like, mustn't become our work too? Yeah. All right. So when you go to Isaiah chapter 61, where the mission of the Messiah is proclaimed, it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Does this imply a war? Oh, definitely. Because it's right against what Satan wants. Okay, so humanity is brokenhearted. Yeah. They've been taken captive mm. by the devil through his lies. And they are actually in prison. Yeah. And they need to be set free. That's the prison of sin. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. It's, a, it's actually... A marvelous mission. It's beautiful. Is it our mission? Yes, every single person. That's our mission, right? Yeah. So in Luke, you find the repetition of this. So the New Testament confirms that this is the mission of the Messiah. Yeah. Not what they expected, right? <laughs> no. It's the exact opposite e of what they expected. Exact opposite. All right. And when Jesus read it, we don't have to read it again because it's the same. Yeah. He ends it here by saying, and he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Wow. What year was that? Just uh, 27 AD. 27 AD. He sat in this church. He'd just come out of the wilderness experience. And he says, this day... Is this scripture fulfilled in your ears? Were they happy with that statement? No. Because he was applying the mission of the Messiah to himself. Yes. But they misconstrued the mission in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds a bit familiar, actually. <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. So when Christ gave his disciples the promise of the Spirit, he was nearing the close of his earthly ministry. He was standing in the shadow of the cross with a full realization of the load of guilt that was to rest upon him as the sin bearer. Before offering himself as a sacrificial victim, he instructed his disciples regarding a most essential and complete gift which he was to bestow upon his followers. The gift that would bring within their reach the boundless resources of his grace. So this was the power that was to change the whole world. It was the divide of history. Mm. You know, you divide it into before Christ and after Christ. Yeah. They don't even like that, so they now make it before common era yeah. and after common era, which is absolute ridiculous idiocy and patheticness. <laughs> it doesn't make sense even. I refuse to use that terminology because they don't want to acknowledge that he is the divide of history. Yeah. I will pray the Father, he said, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. The Savior was pointing forward to the time when the Holy Spirit should come to do a mighty work as his representative. The evil that had been accumulating for centuries was to be resisted by the divine power of the Holy Spirit. So Martin, how can you become right with God? You have to allow the Spirit to change you. Is there any power within you that no. can do it? No, because, and that's the beautiful part. 
ye, that the Holy Spirit will lead you to Christ and His righteousness. Martin, is the only way. When you think about these things, and you think of the Pentecostal movement, is this what is happening there? Is there something else happening there? No, it's something totally different. As, uh -huh. But if you take the <clears throat> ministry of Ben Hinn, it's the whole time this power, power religion. Power, power, but treading on serpents, yes. giving you might, instead of humbling you down to the ground, right? Yeah. So the Holy Spirit represents worldly kingdoms under the symbol of fierce beasts of prey. But Christ is the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. John 1, 29. In his plan of government, there is no employment of brute force to compel the conscience. Oh, wow. We're not going to set up the kingdom by force. The Jews looked for the kingdom of God to be established in the same way as the kingdoms of the world. To promote righteousness, they resorted to external measures. They devised methods and plans, but Christ implants a principle. By implanting truth and righteousness, he counterworks error and sin. So that's why it's so important that church and state cannot come together. No, because why would the church need the state to enforce something? Not to implant a principle. For sure not. You cannot implant a principle. No. You cannot force a principle. They've tried how many times? Communism tried it. They wanted to enforce, to teach you how to think. Yes. But that's, that principle cannot be sustainable. Now, Martin, we talk in this day and age of postmodernism. Mm. We're living in the postmodern age. And, you know, you always think, what? What exactly does that mean? <laughs> Postmodern age. Now, we were up until the 60s, we were in what was called the age of reason, mm. started by the thinkers such as Descartes and Voltaire at the French Revolution. And reason took the place of revelation. So now you had a generation that was based on reason. Mm. And it flourished and you had scientific progress and all of these things. But an emptiness developed in the soul. Yes. There was a divide being captured. Yes. And then you came to the postmodern era, mm. which says... Does this age of reason really supply what is lacking in the soul? No. And then you get to Generation X. Mm -hmm. Generation X. And you wonder, where do all these terms come from and what do they mean? Generation X is from the 60s, from around about 1962 to the 80s. That generation that grew up in the most horrendous circumstances where the meaning of life seemed to escape mm. them. And the drug world was very prevalent. Yeah. And so this generation which found in this age of reason nothing for themselves. Most of them grew up living with their parents because they couldn't afford places of themselves. They didn't get jobs. They were, they were destitute. They were like, like a generation discarded. Mm, mm. And if you look at their statistics, they have the highest divorce rate of all generations in the history of humanity. Yeah. They are a, a trampled generation. And we're living with them because That's those it. are the adults of our day now. And actually, that generation gave, let's say, birth to the reason why people don't want to marry even. Okay. And this generation longs for something better mm. than what the previous generation promised and offered, this great prosperity mm. that never materialized because they can't even afford a house. They're constantly changing relationships. Most of them were dependent upon drugs. And they're looking for some meaning. And now... Christianity is going to be reinvented and give them some meaning. Mm. So Martin, there's this, this, this hunger for something else. 
And they're going to reinvent Christianity as mm. we speak about constantly. There's going to be this pendulum shift. Yes, yes. And thousands upon thousands upon disillusioned people might just grab hold of it. Yeah. And if they don't meet the conditions, they're going to go to perdition. How important is it that we put this in the right perspective? It's paramount. Because like you just mentioned, a lot of people would out of desperation just want to cling on to it. Cling on to but something. But there won't be a heart transformation. No, and so you have these mega TV personalities all of a sudden embracing norms and standards that have been buried by an age of reason yeah. in this postmodern generation X society that we are living in. We're living in a very fascinating time with a very vulnerable humanity. Yeah, that's true. And a very disillusioned humanity. They don't know which way. Is there any trust left mm. in government, for no. example? Nobody trusts government, right? Is there any trust in, in the fraternities, even in the scientific world with its disconcordant notes? You see, the problem is some people cling to it, even though they know it can't even be trusted anymore. Correct. Because they don't have anything else to cling on. Where That's where we have to come in and... Get them to. That's why it's so important that we understand the mission of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. The grace of God takes men as they are and works as an educator, using every principle on which an all sided education depends. The steady influence of the grace of God trains the soul after Christ's mm. method. And every fierce passion. Every defective trait of character is worked upon the molding influence of the Spirit of Christ. So it's his character. Until the man has a new motive power and becomes filled with the Holy Spirit of God after the likeness of the divine similitude, if there is not this transformation, this total transformation, mm -hmm. then it is a spurious transformation. Yes. It's a grabbing at straws. Yeah. Christ came to bring salvation within the reach of all. Upon the cross of Calvary, he paid the infinite redemption price for a lost world. His self-denial and self-sacrifice, his unselfish labor, his humiliation, above all the offering up of his life, testifies to the depth of his love for fallen man. It was to seek and save the lost that he came to earth. His mission was to sinners... Sinners of every grade, of every tongue and nation, he paid the price for all to ransom them and bring them into union and sympathy with himself. The most erring, the most sinful were not passed by. His labors were especially for those who most needed the salvation he came to bring. The greater their need of reform, the deeper was his interest the greater his sympathy. And mild measures, mm. soft answers, pleasant words are much more fitted to reform and save than severity and harshness. Could we apply that in our churches? Wouldn't that be nice? Ooh, I can apply that in my life as well. Mm? I think if we start implementing this, we can get forward to start asking for the Holy Spirit in the latter rain. A little too much unkindness may place persons beyond your reach, while a conciliatory spirit would be the means of binding them to you. And you might then establish them in the right way. You should be actuated by a forgiving spirit also and give due credit to every good purpose and action of those around you. Martin, with all the accusations that are flying around, are we displaying this character, the spirit? No. No. I mean, we have to look at ourselves, don't ourselves, we? Ourselves, but if I just look, uh, think of what's been happening, and we're talking about our church now, in, and I, I think there's a little bit of that lacking at this stage. God has done his part of the work for the salvation of men, and now he calls for the cooperation of the church. There are the blood of Christ, the word of truth, the Holy Spirit on one hand, and there are the perishing souls on the other. 
Every follower of Christ has a part to act to bring men to accept the blessings heaven has provided. Let us closely examine ourselves and see if we have done this work. Let us question our motives and every action of our lives. Are there not many unpleasant pictures hanging in memory halls? So Martin, are we so great because we know the truth? No, if we Aren't don't. there unpleasant pictures in our picture gallery of our lives? Mm -hmm. And if you look at them, perhaps we shouldn't concentrate so much on that, but concentrate on what Christ has done. Yeah, that's true. Often have you needed the forgiveness of Jesus. So shouldn't you be of a forgiving spirit yourself? In the prayer that Jesus gave to the disciples... Father, forgive us as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. So if yeah. you don't forgive those people, you're asking actually the Father not to forgive you. Yeah, correct. You have been constantly dependent upon his compassion and love. Yet, have you not failed to manifest towards others the spirit which Christ has exercised towards you? Mm -hmm. Have you felt a burden for the one whom you saw venturing into forbidden paths? Have you kindly admonished him? Have you wept for him and prayed with him and for him? Have you shown by words of tenderness and kindly acts that you love him and desire to save him? Why are we fulfilling the condition for the outpouring of the Spirit? No, I don't think so. His great heart of love was stirred to its depth for the ones whose condition was most hopeless and who most needed his transforming grace. But there has been among us as a people a lack of deep, earnest, soul-touching sympathy and love for the tempted and the erring. Many have manifested great coldness and sinful neglect represented by Christ as passing by on the other side, keeping as far as possible from those who most need help. The newly converted soul often has fierce conflicts with established habits or some special form of temptation, and being overcome by some master passion or tendency is guilty of indiscretion or actual wrong. It is then that energy, tact and wisdom are required of his brethren, that he may be restored to spiritual health. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Or as Romans says, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. So Martin, the Spirit's work... It's not what people expect. They want power. Yeah. And but they actually, need humility. Ew, and meekness and <coughs> soft, soft spokenness. We don't have to read everything. Let's just read the highlighted portions. Let the tenderness and mercy that Jesus has revealed in his own precious life be an example to us of the manner in which we should treat our fellow beings, especially those who are our brethren in Christ. Mm. Never lose an opportunity to say a word to encourage and inspire hope. I wish we could all practice that. Well, let's make it a challenge. It's so much nicer to condemn someone. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but that's because we don't have the, the, the spirit of truth that's convicting us. So let's make it a challenge. Let's see if we can from now on try this. All right. Now let's, can I throw another spanner in the works? Yeah? <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a whole toolbox full of it. So, <laughs> so we might as well use the spanners. Let's irritate everybody while we're busy, right? Does our lifestyle play a role? For sure. <laughs> it's, it's one of those portions that everything is fine, but uh, this one, we'll look after it later. So God will give his people ability and tact to prepare wholesome food without these things. In other words, these things are all the things that you shouldn't actually have to have on your table. Let our people discard all unwholesome recipes. Let them learn how to live healthfully. 
teaching to others what they have learned. Let them impart this knowledge as they would Bible instruction. Mm. That's quite quite a heavy. You see now, <laughs> the, some. Uh, let me just put it there. Some people must now rem- remember what we've just s- said before of the meekness and humility and the... So don't attack now. Just be meek and listen. Okay. Let them teach the people to preserve the health and increase the strength by avoiding the large amount of cooking that has filled the world with chronic invalids. By precept and example, make it plain. Now listen to this, Martin. That the food which God gave Adam in his sinless state is the best for man's use as he seeks to regain that sinless state. You. So who's working in you to help you to regain a better state? The Holy Spirit is working in you. But there's requirements to... It's it's with the the rest of the requirements we've just read. This is part of that. All right. So, Martin, diet and the narrow road to attain to the character of Christ are connected, right? Cannot sever. So if you want unity, do we have to be of one accord as far as this is concerned as well? We have to. Does this form part of the spirit of prophecy and of the Bible message? So what is on your plate? Can it affect what's in the heart? Yes, for sure. All right, Martin, so we are to rebuke evil in the world, but we may not judge the soul. Mm. And there's a very clear distinction between the two. Leviticus 19.17, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. You may not hate him, but you may rebuke him. So it says here you cannot... Judge, but you can rebuke. Yes, you, you actually you, you should rebuke. You should. Yeah. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 5, It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. So are you supposed to be rebuking people? But with obviously the love that we've just... Everything read. we've spoken about. Yeah. So it's it's some <laughs> people love the rebuking. <laughs> But they fail to see the portion that we just discussed. (laughs) Or 2 Timothy 4 verse 2, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. Can you throw doctrine out the window? No. No, it's your standard for your rebuke and reproof. Of course. But the Pope says we must throw doctrine out the window. Yeah, because that... Makes it a nice, comfy, uh, ecumenical gathering. All right. Now, this is, this, is, this is the tricky part. You're supposed to do all these things, but you're not supposed to neglect the way in which it's supposed to be exactly. done. Exactly. So <clears throat> once you read these, you should read the way in which you should do it as well, that we've just mentioned in the previous section. Now, I found this statement in Councils for the Church very fascinating. Christ humbled himself to stand at the head of humanity, to meet the temptations and endure the trials that humanity must meet and endure. He must know what humanity has to meet from the fallen foe, that he might know how to succor those who are tempted. And Christ has been made our judge. The Father is not the judge. Hmm. That's a very interesting statement because <laughs> Jesus confirms it. He says, all judgment has been given unto me, right? Yeah. So the Father is not the judge. The angels are not. He took humanity upon himself and in this world lived the perfect life. He is to judge us. He is the one. Yeah. He who took the humanity. Yeah. He only can be our judge. Will you remember this, brethren? Will you remember it, ministers? Will you remember it, fathers and mothers? Christ took humanity that he might be our judge. No one of you has been appointed to be a judge of others. <laughs> so I may say to you, when what you are doing is not helpful. It's very destructive. It's actually your duty. It, 
wouldn't it yeah. be better if we did it this way or that way? Yeah. Or I could say, you know, if you continue like that, you're going to go to hell. No, 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 <laughs> what's, no. what's the difference between the two? <laughs> the one is the spirit of truth is missing. And it's judgment. Yeah, that one You've is, already judged. Exactly. That, that's yeah. already giving a judgment. Correct. Yeah. So no one of you has been appointed to judge others. You may judge the actions yeah. and then bring the rebu rebuke, Ooh. but you may not judge the outcome. That's not your job. Well, if you want to judge the action, the rebuke part, it's just, it, it has to be adjusted on how you bring it over. Okay. It is all that you can do to discipline yourselves. In the name of Christ, I entreat you to heed the injunction that he gives you never to place yourselves on the judgment seat. From day to day, this message has been sounded in my ears. Come down from the judgment seat. Come down in humility. Mm. And Martin, this is what we're supposed to do. Yeah. This is what the Spirit is supposed to lead us to. Well, I can. I was. I would just want to say here as well mm. that it, there's a flip side also. If somebody comes to you with a very loving rebuke, you should also let the spirit of truth work in you and take it with a good heart and not flare up in a rebellion. Yes, but even if they flare up in rebellion, you're not allowed to the, judge them. Because the other one must still stay Maybe meek. just trod on a corn. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now we've seen what the Holy Spirit is supposed to do. Mm. So, Martin, before the Holy Spirit can be poured out in a great measure, Satan will make sure that there is a counterfeit spirit, right? Mm -hmm. And you can be sure that none of those criteria that we have discussed will be met by the false spirit. So there will be a counterfeit spirit before the end. Notwithstanding the widespread declension of faith and piety, they are true followers of Christ in the churches, all the churches out there, including the Roman Catholic Church, yeah, for sure. including the Pentecostal churches. They are true seekers of Christ mm -hmm. in these churches. And before the final visitation of God's judgment upon the earth, there will be amongst the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. The Spirit and power of God will be poured out upon His children, and at that time many will separate themselves from those churches in which the love of this world has supplanted love for God and His Word. Both ministers and people will gladly accept those great truths which God has caused to be proclaimed at this time to prepare a people for the Lord's second coming. The enemy of souls desires to hinder this work. And before the time for such a movement shall come, he will endeavor to prevent it by introducing a counterfeit. In those churches which he can bring under his deceptive power, he will make it appear that God's special blessing is poured out. There will be manifest what is thought to be a great religious interest. Multitudes will exult that God is working marvelously for them when the work is that of another spirit. Under a religious guise, Satan will seek to extend his influence over the Christian world. Mm. Now, one of the things that the Pentecostal movement is achieving in the world is unity of the churches. That's true. They have a pivotal role in ecumenism. Mm. So doctrine is being set aside. Yeah. And the feeling and the manifestation of the Spirit, particularly with regards to speaking in tongues, mm -hmm. will show that God is on their side. Mm. With signs and wonders. With signs and wonders. But doctrine is lightly regarded. Yeah. And that which God separated in the Reformation is being reunited. Yeah. That tells you there's something wrong with that spirit. Mm, mm. The senses of rational beings will become so confused that they cannot be trusted to make right decisions. A bedlam of noise shocks the senses, perverts that which if conducted aright might be a blessing. The powers of satanic agents blend with the dim and noise 
to have a carnival in the system, the Holy Spirit's working. Hmm. We've seen that in videos hmm. of the music being music, played. Music, hmm. the way in which it is conducted. Those things which have been in the past will be in the future. Satan will make music a snare by the way in which it is conducted. Let us give no place to strange exercisings which will really take the mind away from the deep moving of the Holy Spirit. God's work is ever characterized by calmness and dignity. Mm. Calmness and dignity. So that which has to happen in the heart cannot be replaced by a manifestation and a bedlam of noise. No. There will be false speaking in tongues, false excitement, fanaticism, false talking in tongues. Now, we've dealt with all of these mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. We don't have to go into detail. It's in the book of Corinthians that Paul addresses the false speaking in tongues, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And He addresses the gifts as well in, in other epistles, like Ephesians, yeah. for example. He doesn't even mention tongues. Mm. But the, the, the gift that is mentioned last is the one that is exalted to the first position. The, that's what the church is doing currently. Yeah. What the church is doing. And if you do not receive this, it is a symbol that the Holy Spirit is not working in you. Yeah. So if you have the manifestation, then you have the Spirit. But the same spirit, Martin, occurs in Hinduism. Yeah. It occurs in shamanism. It occurred in the ancient religion, Sibylline worship, for example, in the Roman uh, sages. Mm. They all spoke in tongues. Did they have the truth? No. And it says they are leading Protestants and Catholicism to come together again. So this is actually a uniting spirit, but a false one. It must be a false spirit, yeah. because it is ignoring the very basis upon which the Holy Spirit is to be poured out. True, and that's... Do these churches not say that the Lord has been done away with? Yes. And if you've done away with the law, haven't you done away with truth? 100%. Haven't you done away with the very reason why Christ had to die on the cross? That's it. And so, the spirit of truth. So then can it be the spirit of truth? It can only be a spirit. Yes. But not, not the spirit of truth. So they have what we call here an excitement of feeling. Mm, mm. But the influence of such meetings is not beneficial. When the happy flight of feeling is gone, they sink lower than before the meeting because their happiness didn't come from the right source. The most profitable meetings for spiritual advancement are those which are characterized with solemnity and deep searching of heart, each seeking to know himself and earnestly and in a deep humility seeking to learn of Christ. So... There is already a false outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Mm. And it has to be met. And we may not become discouraged. The Lord would have cheer every such worker with the same message that he gave to the Apostle Paul in wicked Corinth. Be not afraid. Speak. Hold not thy peace, for I am with thee. And no man shall sit on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. God has many sincere souls in, in all of these churches. Mm. And we may not become discouraged. We may not become condemning. We may condemn the error. Yes, and we must keep the balance. And with the spirit of meekness, we must show the error. So that true. is what, what we need to do. That's what the Holy Spirit must prepare His church to do. So not abstain from... Talking to the people. No. Not keep your rebuke, mouth shut. Rebuke not, with yeah. all. Because a lot of people now say, leave them where they are. No, you can't mm. leave them where they are. You can't leave them in error. You have to warn them. So Martin, the point we're trying to make here, I think, is that the preconditions for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit must first be met before we can have a Pentecostal experience. Mm. And unfortunately, before that can happen, there must be a shaking. Yeah. Because you cannot have all the different opinions in one accord. 
You cannot have those that accept the spirit of prophecy in one accord with those who reject it. We cannot have those that accept half and reject another half in one accord with those who no. accept it all. No. We cannot have those that honor the law in one accord with those that don't. No. We cannot hold to doctrines of salvation like the atonement and sit in ecumenical <laughs> councils with those that reject it. No. And even those that accept it, who set aside the doctrines in order for the sake of unity, they are also on the wrong side of the fence. The wrong, sorry. So there must be a shaking. There was a shaking of the disciples as well. Yes. After the shaking, the Holy Spirit only could come. Correct. Those that were not part of them from the beginning... They had to leave. So the mighty shaking has commenced and will go on. Oh. Martin, it's already commenced. Mm. That means there are people that have taken a stand for an issue. And they're living amongst the people that have not taken a stand. That doesn't mean that you leave the people. It means you have to wait till the shaking takes place. And they will be shaken out who are not willing to take a bold and unyielding stand for the truth and to sacrifice for God and his cause. The angel said, think ye that any will be compelled to sacrifice? No, no. It must be a free will offering. It will take all to buy the field. I cried to God to spare his people, some of whom were fainting and dying. Then I saw that the judgments of the Almighty were speedily coming, and I begged of the angel, Speak in his language to the people, said he. All the thunders and lightnings of Mount Sinai would not move those who will not be moved by the plain truths of the word of God. Neither would an angel's message awake them. There's only one thing that can happen. There must be a shaking. You must... They must decide to go. They don't want to be yes. part of this movement that will be ready for the latter rain. Right. Hebrews 12, 25. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not to refuse him that speaks back on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifies the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. So the shaking will be a shaking out, out. Martin. Yeah, it's a spitting out, shaking out. Hebrews 12, verse 28, Wherefore we receive a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for God, our God is a consuming fire. Martin, God will do the shaking. That's true. When laws are made which make void the law of God, mm. people will have to make a decision. Mm. And it's Right before the door. Yeah. It's going to happen. And God will do the shaking. And then we have this final quote. The church may appear as about to fall, but it does not fall. It remains. While the sinners in Zion will be sifted out. The chaff separated from the precious wheat. This is a terrible ordeal, but nevertheless it must take place. Mm -hmm. Martin, I believe that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit will not take place until the shaking has come. It, and the shaking mm -hmm. will be brought about by the events prophesied. Yeah, and one of those is the preaching of the straight testimony. Yes. And... It is right to play, pray for the outpouring of mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit, but a personal preparation is what God requires now so that when the events take place, we will be so settled in the mm. truth that we cannot be moved. Let's pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, 
The world is expecting the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We see many manifestations in the world, but they are not based on righteousness and truth. To the contrary, they negate the law of God. They bring about unity in false doctrines. And so, Lord, we wait for the outpouring of the Spirit of Truth. The Spirit that will lead to a greater consecration to the Word, to Christ and to His law. And prepare our hearts that we may be Christ-like to be entitled to be part of that loud cry. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.